check in and being quiet and being on time. I think we've probably lost a couple to happy hour, but that is totally their loss. Um, I'm really excited to, again, another person I see online, but that's the first time we've met in person. Eric Wallet is an osteopath, massage therapist, and personal trainer residing in Montreal, Canada. Eric has hosted many conferences on pain science and the biopsychosocial model, encouraging their clinical applications. He can speak to the truth of that in a minute. I'm just reading what they gave me. Um, their clinical applications in manual therapy. He pursues his passion to communicate evidence-informed reasoning by teaching dermoneuromodulation and partici participating in events held in Quebec, France, and the US. Thank you very much. Is this on? Good. Yes. Everybody hear me fine? Yes. <clears throat> I'm now amplified. Hi, my name is Eric, and I'm French. So, uh, you know, my ideas, right now I'm pretty nervous, so ideas run pretty fast in my head, and sometimes the words get in the way. So I might slow down, I might stumble, but that'll be pretty much it. And, um, yeah, so I'm an osteopath, I'm a manual therapist, I'm also a massage therapist, so I like the umbrella of manual therapy under both of those uh, labels. And I imagine a lot of people here are also manual therapists, right? We all use our hands to uh, help people along. And uh, the great thing is, is that uh, we have all these wonderful stories, or at least we hear them, of all the wonderful things that we can do with our hands and feel and all this stuff that really is unique to manual therapists if they have the proper training. And uh, here, well, I'm gonna talk about the illusions of touch. The idea is to deconstruct palpation because uh, it can't really happen that way. And we all know that. We're pretty much, we should all be familiar with intra and inter-rater reliability. And uh, I won't get into that. And another thing I won't get to, this is San Diego Pain Summit, and I won't talk about pain. But maybe I'll mention it. And uh, we're just gonna go through this. Uh, and this is sort of a, you know, I, I set this up sort of like a story to tell, and I do read a lot of my notes on the screen, right? And, uh, you know, you can forgive me for that, for having written all those things down. They're like better than my memory, but also I don't really care. I'll get better at it eventually. And uh, that's pretty much it. So we're gonna start off with giving credit where credit is due, and we're gonna talk about this little piece of machinery. This is uh, the basic anatomy of the hand, right? 22 major and minor bones, so give or take a few. At least 123 named ligaments, 35 muscles, which moves the finger and thumbs, uh, 17 in the palm of the hand and 18 in the forearm. All this, all this for this little piece of machinery, which is pretty amazing. And uh, we have 48 named nerves, three major nerves, 24 named sensory branches, 21 named muscular branches, and 30 named arteries, and nearly as many smaller named branches. So there's a lot of stuff in here. And uh, usually before, when I presented this before, I said, you know, at my three hour lecture, I'll get into the nitty gritty of all that stuff, you know, and detail it out. And finally, no, I won't do that. I'll just keep it that way. I just want this to be very brief. And the thumb is controlled by nine individual muscles, which are controlled by all three major hand nerves, and a thumb possesses a very elaborate and complex movement pattern. This disting distinguishes us very, very highly, all right? Uh, many pri uh, primates have an opposable thumb. We're not the only creatures with opposable thumbs, but we're the only ones who can do this, all right? Which gives us, gives us a lot of leeway in how we grasp objects. It's a specificity. Wow, the French man said specificity. <laughs> And the muscles which power the fingers are really, really strong. We do amazing things with that. And this is a fun fact. The force generated by the muscles which bend at the fingertips must be at least four times greater than the pressure which is produced at the fingertips. We need it to be very strong or things would just slip out of our hands. We lift heavy weights. We lift our bodies against rocks. Our fingers, this, these little pieces of bone are held by muscles that are extremely powerful. And the hand is just amazing. It does wonderful things. We can communicate. We can play music. We can compose pieces that, if you can hear one musician sometimes play the piano or the guitar, you can actually wonder, is he really alone? If you can't see him play, what comes out with what we can do with our hands is absolutely amazing. We can do beautiful pieces of art. 
And this, I, can't, I still can't write, write, wrap my mind around this. I wonder if the person breathes when they do this, but that is very, very, very fine motor control. Those are hands sculpted in the, um, in the, in the pencil tip. And we even need machinery to amplify whatever we're working on to give our hands greater motor, or at least to exploit the motor control that our hands are capable of and work on very, very small objects to the point of doing very, very fine surgery and brain surgery. So, I didn't set this up properly, but to act out into the world, we need to feel it, right? We need to be able to hold stuff in our hands. We need to be able to act upon things. We need to be able to feel, to identify the things that we, we, we interact with. And humans are remarkably sensitive to move, movements of skin. Humans can report the direction of skin. This is on the forearm with movements as small as 0.13 millimeters, right? Those are movements that are barely detected through vision. So we can have our hand on, we can have something on our forearm and we can detect movement, but we won't see it move. We're that sensitive, and it's even higher on the hand, but I don't have that, um, that, that, uh, that data here. The receptors for fine touch and pressure are extremely sensitive and have a narrow receptive field, a very narrow receptive field. We have 1,700 receptors that inhabit one hand, where, of which 1,650 per every fingertip. That's, that's a lot, right? We get a lot of information from our hands and our fingertips. And information is processed in the fingertips. Not only do they send the signals up, but peripheral neurons in the touch processing pathways perform feature extractions, computations, that are typically attributed to neurons in the cerebral cortex. The neurons, the peripheral neurons in the tip of our fingers process the information before it even reaches our brain. So it can feel the, tempor the uh, temporal and texture of the objects and identify exactly how to adapt at that moment before it's even processed in our brain. So we have a nervous reaction. Sometimes we can have something in our hands and if we feel it slip, we'll just grab onto it instinctively. So, this is my audience participation moment, right? And our touch is so sensitive and you guys get to respond. Okay, we'll get this one more time, right? Because this was just a warm up. Our sense of touch is so sensitive it's so sensitive that it can detect molecular differences. It's my punchline. <laughs> okay, every, every surface has a different stick-slip frequency due to the identity of the molecules in the topmost layer. And this was tested, right? Researchers tested whether human subjects could distinguish between smooth silicon wafers that differed only in their single topmost layer of molecules. So they had three wafers, silicone wafers, and so they, they gave it to certain sub, to subjects who would try to identify if there were a difference between them. One surface was a single oxidized layer made of mostly oxygen atoms, and the other was a single Teflon-like layer made of fluorine and carbon atoms, all right? Fifteen subjects were tested, right, to tell the difference between the three wafers, and the success rate was 71%. We can tell very, very, very minute differences. So this is just to put into, con to, to, into perspective how good we are with this piece of machinery. Touch ascends the brain using the spin spinothalamic pathway. <sighs> Input reaches the thalamus where signals are sorted out and processed before being relayed to the primary sensory cortex in the cerebral hemisphere, right? Sending off to the brain a picture, all right? And let's do a little test here, okay? Once again, you'll have to close your eyes, okay? Now, carefully, I want you to reach out in front of you and grab something, anything. Okay, I'll assume that everybody has something in their hands. Do they know what it is that they have in their hands? Can you picture it in your mind? There you go. Would you be able to do otherwise? Would you be able to identify whatever it is in your, head, in your hand without making a mental picture of it? It's a true question. Well, I'll say, I'll answer for you guys, okay? I'll answer for you, San Diego. No, I don't think you can. You need to identify the object you're holding in your hand and 
The science says that your visual cortex is involved in that. It sends to the brain a picture. And whatever you identify, you, can't, you, can't, you cannot visualize or create a mental picture of what it is that you're identifying in your hand. Right? So the information is sent to the primary motor cortex, the som somatosensory cortex, and this is the homunculus, right? So, and here we have the hand, and there are different uh, images and interpretations of this, and I personally like this one. All right? It just puts into perspective how much cortical real estate that these things, these beautiful muttons, take. And this, this reminds me also, every time I see this, it reminds me of a Warner Brothers cartoon, the Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know? <laughs> hey, George, I just shot a moose. It had antlers like this. And then he'd get shot. And what does that tell us? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I just wanted to say so. <laughs> it's really not important. But th that's 17,000 receptors right there right, that <laughs> occupy cortical real estate in your somatosensory cortex. Okay. And this is me, and I do this kind of stuff, all right? And this is where, this, this presentation is a lot of conjecture, right? I put stuff together to prove a point, and to tell a story, and to lead you along the way at that story and arrive at a conclusion, right, about what I think happens when we palpate people, right? And so there's a lot of evidence-informed opinions, and I have sort of a system also when I do presentations. I have like a yellow card, red card system. A yellow card, when I put up a yellow card, it's an informed opinion, right? Evidence-informed opinion, but it's still an opinion. And at least I say so. This is my opinion, and it's proven by stuff like that. So my whole presentation is a yellow card. And sometimes I have a red card, where it's just my opinion, and it's me babbling on. And I might be wrong, but I don't care, but at least I'm holding on the red card, and I'm declaring that it's just my opinion, all right? And this, well, I do this stuff. And I really like doing this stuff. I do this stuff in osteopathy and in massage as much as I can. I hold people's head in my hands, and they love it. People fall asleep. And I just let the nonspecific effects just rush through. It's like a nonspecific effect bonanza. They love it. And I'm sure there's a reason why it's effective. And well, effective. It's not effective, but why it has such an effect. And just this is a red card moment, and I'll just want to share that with you. Because you know, everybody here was born, obviously. And the first thing for most of us, hopefully, that happened when we were born is that we were picked up and held against our mother. And for a new nervous system, right, to have that, to be, to be comforted like that, to be soothed like that, is probably the biggest thing that happens in the first few seconds of your life. And this has happened for generations and generations and generations. It's an extremely soothing thing. So I think this, putting our heads on our hand, is a lot of classical conditioning. But that's just my opinion. It's a red card. And that's why it feels good. And we shouldn't really bother with what we think we're doing. But I do this all the time. And a lot of people do this with a certain more specific intent. But here's, here's the thing. Here's where I want to get to with this, right? This is me with my eyes open, OK? And I have. And I can see the, head, the person's head. And this is what happens when I close my eyes. <laughs> my huge hands, I mean, it becomes my world. My fingers are this big. They reach halfway across the room. If I feel something move, and I can, because our hands are very sensitive, it goes like this. And stuff does move. There's a lot of stuff that moves under there. I really don't care what it is. It moves. I play with it. But it happens. And when I open my eyes, well, there. My hands aren't moving. What's happening? I can look away. Oh, wow, yeah. And stuff happens. And I play with that. Sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't always. But most of the time, when you close your eyes and you feel something, it amplifies. I don't know if you guys do this, but usually when I, when I like, try to look for something under the couch or whatever and I can't see it, I close my eyes to get a better mental picture of where my hand is and what it is I'm feeling for, what I'm handling. When I'm rummaging in the dark, I usually close my eyes because I can't depend on these. I can depend on these. Right? And this is where it gets sort of funky, and I feel really, really interesting, right? Because memory researchers link two brain regions to conceptual organization. The hippocampus contributes to the generalization of concepts and works with the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in real time to organize experiences according to their similarities and differences, OK? So what this means is there not only is a precise idea ingrained in our mind's eye, but an abstract representation to help us link events together. Right? So we know what a dog looks like, but then this is also a dog. 
but not really. It's just a representation of a dog. It's an abstract representation of a dog. And it's a shortcut to help us understand the world and make a decision or have a reaction. Right? We think in abstract form. And to prove the point, and we, re we react. It, I mean, ab abstract images are like metaphors. We react to them. They make sense to us. Right? And we create stories with them. We link things together with that. And proof, well, proof of this, at least an exercise to get my point across, <laughs> saying proof of this is pretty heavy with this crowd. I have to watch out. But an exercise to get this point across is we know exactly what this is right at the first glance. Right? It's just squiggles on a page. But they're beautiful squiggles, and we know exactly what it is or what's trying to be conveyed here. It has meaning for us. Even this. Right? And I went really easy with this one because we're, we're meant, we're programmed to recognize faces. And so we can easily identify the faces here. And of course, you know, this is a beautiful autumn scenery. I'm sure everybody can see this. I hope everybody can see this. But it may not mean everything, the same thing to everybody. But this one here, this is me watching Netflix. <laughs> you didn't get that, but it is. And we search for meaning. We always look at things and we're looking for patterns and it has an effective value. It has a, we have an emotional response to whatever's happening and we try to make sense out of it even if we can't. But I can almost see a face in there somewhere, but I know it's not there. And so this is my abstract painting, right? And I have a story behind this, okay? And I was massaging, okay? And I was doing what I do when I usually massage, you know, rub oil on the person and everything like that. And at a certain point in the massage, a searing pain shot up in my back and my leg buckled, right? And I had to hold myself onto the table. And at that moment, the image that came through my mind was this and boom, this. And that's the first thing that came through my mind. And I go, what? With that pain, instantly, in a microsecond, there was this image, okay? It's a very abstract image. It's the best representation, visual represent, representation I could do of it. And this may be unique to me because I'm a vis very visually oriented person, in case you didn't get that. But can anybody identify what I might have associated my back pain with, with this image? A bulging disc. That's the first thing that went to my mind because of this image associated with the pain. OK? And at that point, I was there. What was that? And I started continuing to massage, leaning onto the person. And this, this is great. You know, you can do that massage, and she didn't notice anything. So I kept going, and I was thinking, OK, I have to be really careful. I'm sure it's not a herniated disc, but I, I don't know. I'll just check if the, uh, the, 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 the symptoms aggravate, if my leg gets numb or something like that, if I need to call my mom. But I'll see how this works out. And finally, I was able to finish a massage. It did hurt, but I didn't have the cold sweats anymore, and the pain did go away around a week or two later. Okay? It took a lot of time for me to work that pain around, but it went away. And I reasoned myself into thinking, well, it's probably not a herniated disc. I hope so, but I don't know for sure, so I'll just be very careful, and everything was fine. But this, this moment, is ingrained. I can't get rid of this moment anymore, especially now that I drew it and I'm showing it to everybody. Now everybody can share it back to me. Hey, Eric, remember that time where you drew a pic an abstract painting of a breakfast? But, um, and our brain tries to link things together, right? It tries to make a coherent story out of events. And it's particularly true, and it gets particularly weird when we can't visually identify that event and we have a mental picture of it. Right? If I bump myself, if I get a bruise, if I get a cut, if anything physical happens to me and I can visually identify it, I know what I've done. Right? Oh, I bump myself, I have a bruise here, or I cut myself, whatever. It's reassuring. At least I know what happened. If I have a certain pain that I don't know where it came from, it's inside of me, I'm going to try to create a story of what is this pain. And at least I'm visually oriented, so I noticed that I did make up an image, but I'm sure everybody here makes up an image, I'm sure, everybody here makes up an image of their internal world and stuff that happens, whether it be abstract or more figurative. But this came up and it helped me tell a story. Doesn't say the story was true though, but culturally in the way I was set up in my education, that's what popped up. I don't know why. 
And we know that our brains, our visual cortex, maps movement. So we can see that there's a lot of visualization and graded, integrated motor imagery also. The, if, the effect increased of pain in line with the duration of symptoms and uh, symptoms seem to be modulated by autonomic arousal and beliefs about pain and movement. Now just to put this picture here, right? This is a person observing movement. This is a person imagining movement. And this is a person, and it's just a graphic representation, right? But this stuff does happen also, and it's fun to, to have it uh, drawn out that way. And this is a person, the, the activity in the brain of a person performing the movement. They did this test with rats. Do I have it here? No. They did a test with rats where they mapped out the visual cortex of rats. And they mapped out like the, the activity of 10,000 neurons in the visual cortex in rats where they shut out the lights, right? The rats were playing in the dark and there was still some activities in the, uh, the, those 10,000 neurons in the visual cortex. And they wondered, how come there's so much activity? Is that just noise? So they put a camera where they could uh, record the rats and see them and they associated the activity that the rat was doing, like washing a whisker or doing stuff like that, with the activity in the visual cortex. So not only is my, are my actions mapped by my visual cortex, my visual cortex is making some, like a Muppet representation of everything I'm doing to keep things mapped. We also map around things that we observe and imagine. Our visual cortex is always busy doing the work of mapping stuff around just to make sure that things are coherent in, uh, in the space we, uh, we occupy. And do visual and tactile objects representation share the same neural substrates? Haptics provide information about the weight, compliance, and temperature of an object, as well as information about its surface features and texture. A visual representation of an object can be activated as much by a haptic presentation of the object as by a vis visual presentation and vice versa. Even congenit congenitally, I didn't say that right, blind people have activities in their visual cortex. Okay, when you, people who read Bri, well, when they read Bri, Bri, is that right? Did I say that right? And they read it fairly fast. It does active, there is some activity in their visual cortex. They have a mental representation of what they're feeling with their hands. This is recorded. Neuroimaging studies that have demonstrated that visual and haptic processing overlap within the human brain. The lateral occipital complex is equally activated bilaterally, bilaterally by visual and haptic exploration of objects and shows equivalent priming effects whether prior exposure was visual or haptic. That's a fancy way of saying what I've just been saying. It's busy, the visual cortex is busy map mapping stuff out. All right? And senses cohabit in the visual cortex. And when one uses touch to explore an object, a mental image of the object is constructed. And this process of constructing a mental image recruits the extra strip cortex, which is, here we go, here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Extra strip regions specialize in tasks such as visual spatial, sp spatial processing, color discrimination, and motion perception. So, there is no doubt that mental images of objects are constructed when they are haptically explored for the purposes of recognition. And there is also no doubt that these mental images are predominantly visual. Right, so what do we know about vision? <laughs> we don't know that much about vision, okay? We, we, but it's a really interesting subject. So what do we know? A big part of how we see the dress, right, because there was a, they tried to study the phenomenon, what, what, what was going on with this dress? A big part of how we see the dress has to do with a process called color constancy, right? And you can't have like a talk and a pain group without showing this picture, right? But everybody here knows that the square here is the same color as the square here. They're both the same gray. It's only the different, the only difference is the outline color around that square, A and B, are the exact same colors, just we perceive them differently, right? It's a contrast uh, stimulation test. So th these squares are the exact same color. It's just a contour that makes us interpret this one as darker and this one as lighter. So what we know about our sensor vision, 
How you see the dress depends partly on what inferences you make about the lighting. The context of what surrounds the dress will influence the color of the you see of the dress, right? So this square is the same color as this square, but because the surrounding color or the surrounding context is different, we interpret it differently. But if you shut that out, you see right away that it turns brown, and now it's orange again, and you just can't see that. And now it's orange again, and now it's brown. So your first impression is the one that is most likely to stick. If you see it one color the first time, it, you'll have a lot of problems seeing it a different color as, as the second time, third time. You'll have a lot of problems unseeing it. But the differences in the eye may also account for the illusion. The way we perceive might not at all be about the color constancy and top-down brain processing. We interpret colors differently. Researchers have failed to come up with a theory that can satisfactorily explain the dichotomic behavior of the population when viewing the said optical illusion. So there are lots of possibilities for how experiences shapes our varied perception of color in ambiguous scenes, all of which remain to be studied, right? And I took these uh, poll quotes from Bo Lodo's TED Talk because he gave a, I don't know if most people probably saw it, optical illusions show how we see. The brain doesn't hear sound or see light. What we perceive is its best, best guess of what's out there in the world. So this, this is just a picture, but everybody can see it move, right? And then the projectors are good enough because the first time I did this, the projectors weren't that high quality and it's like, oh, damn. But that's great. Now, what I like to say is convince me that it's not moving, but it's not. It's not a, it's not a GIF, right, or a GIF. It's, it's just a JPEG. But we perceive motion. And here, can, can you spot the black dot? It's everywhere. We can get a hold of it. It's all over the place. So context matters. You can't have, you can't have a pain talk without showing this picture. No, but I love this picture. So the experience of pain, which was the cold rod at minus 20 degrees Celsius, the perception of that pain was different when exposed to a blue light. It was less when exposed to a blue light as opposed to a red light. So a red light had increased. The context mattered. Pain, past experience and expectation may be more important than genetics in how, our, how strongly our visual apparatus is influenced and how it influences our reaction, perception, and behavior. And this is another talk which I took a lot of pull quotes. It's from Anal Seth, your brain hallucinates your conscious reality, and that doesn't give many chances about where I'm going, right? You're probably guessing everything. Oh, well, yeah, of course he's going there. Figuring out what's there has to be a process of informed guesswork in which the brain combines these sensory signals with its prior expectations or beliefs about the way the world is to form its best guess of what caused those signals. So look at the black dot right in the middle. Keep looking at it. Don't let it go, okay? This is just gonna last a few, few seconds. A black bar at the bottom is reaching its destination and something's gonna happen. The suspense is killing me. Okay, now blink. So as soon as something changed, did everybody get that? You wanna do it again? Because it's fun, right? Even when you expect it. All right, try not to see that. Once the information change, your brain will do its best possible work to fill in the gaps. The information changes. Oh, then it must look that color. It must look. And then you blink. And then it's a black and white picture. Your brain fills in the blanks. And it's really fun. It's fun. You know, then I know everybody's going to go on Google and check like hallucinations and they're going to freak out about all the things that are on. I, I had a hard time picking out illusions. I said, okay, I'm just going to settle with this one. It's like, another one, another one. So I cut out a lot of illusions. But we're really heavily visually dependent and we can alter bodily perceptions through visual illusions, right? The mirror box therapy is an example of that. 
Has anybody ever tried this, by the way? It's freaky. I've done the rubber hand illusion. You've done the rubber hand illusion? It's weird. Yeah, I haven't done it yet, but, uh, but there it is, the rubber hand illusion, and it's been extensively studied, and we, we don't doubt that, right? I mean, even the body temperature of your hand diminishes because the importance is attributed to the, uh, the perceived hand and not necessarily the felt hand, which is pretty amazing. And also, these, these are really great, and I love uh, Tasha Stanton's work on this. Bodily illusions, bodily resizing illusions will influence the pain that we perceive, right? The, I did say perceive. The effect of resizing illusions modulate osteo osteoarthritic pain and swelling. So people who would look at their leg, right, would see it with uh, the special camera, would see it either, would get uh, visual feedback of the leg either being stretched out, compressed, and it would alter the way they felt their leg or they perceived their leg. Very, very visually dependent on how we perceive our world. And when we use VR, that's an also it's an example, and more studies of VR are coming, concerning VR are coming out, and I'm really interested in that. When visual proprioceptive feedback understates true neck rotation, pain-free range of motion is increased compared with that during accurate visual feedback. So what happened here is that a person would turn their neck 30 degrees, and ah, it would hurt. You put on the VR goggles, and they would turn their head, and in the VR goggles, instead of going 30 degrees, they'd see 15. <laughs> So they'd reach over for 15 more, and it wouldn't hurt because they would get visual feedback that they've only reached halfway, so it's okay to go the other, the other half. Uh, also, they've done tests with um, uh, children in a children's hospital where they were cleaning burn, burn wounds, right? And uh, an extremely painful process. The kids would hate it, and they said, okay, well, let's try this with the VR goggles. It was a program called Cool, which was, would uh, reflect a very cool, very uh, soothing environment. So the kid would be with the VR glasses, and then after a while, the kid said, okay, well, just tell me when you're starting. And then the doctors answered, well, we're finished. It completely changed his perception of what was going on. It was enough to really down-modulate the pain for what he, for the children are excessively unpleasant uh, moments of pain. And the social role of haptics. Also, we determine a lot more with our uh, hands. Experiences with specific objects, re object-related tactile qualities elicit a haptic mindset such that, such that touching objects triggers the application of associated concepts. The touch relates important information with metaphors applied to better describe our world rough, smooth. It also influences our perception of the world, giving us effect effective vantage points, right? So an example of this, the volunteers were asked to evaluate resumes, and the resumes that were attached to a clipboard of one or two different weights. Subjects who evaluated the candidate while holding the heavier clipboard tended to judge the candidates when they were asked to evaluate the value of the candidate to be more serious. You know, he could handle weighty matters. Yeah, we use metaphors to define our world that, that way. Uh, I read not too long ago, and this was really interesting, that uh, these uh, expectancy or the uh, yeah, expectancy uh, tests that were uh, made uh, have been, they've tried to reproduce them and they weren't able to. So the irony is not lost on me that when you do a test on expectancy, you'll expect the result and you'll probably want favorable results, and when you do it not expecting favorable results, you can't reproduce them, which is pretty interesting. So I think it's ironic, and I think it's worth mentioning because it skews information, and that's what we do, right? And we see what's relevant to us. We see what's important to us. Of course, we all see the dolphins, right? <laughs> it's what's most important to us. It's what's really most relevant to us. So we're primed to see Everybody can see the dolphins? No. One dolphin, two dolphin, three dolphin, four, five, six, seven, right? We're rigged to see the stuff that's really important to us. We can't help it. Now you can see the dolphin, but you can't unsee the other thing. We achieve this now with all this with uh, screwing around visual and uh, objects and uh, representations, priming and conditioning on touch, we achieve this with visual representation associated with tactile feedback. 
when you had a, whatever object you had in your hand and you had a mental picture of what that object was, when, when we have our hand on somebody doing something, it creates a mental image. And there's a lot of stuff going on. Chaos is inherently unordered and unpredictable. All right, there's a lot of stuff going under the human body, under the, under the skin, in the human body. The brain must use a lot of energy and resources to process truly chaotic information. The brain can reduce the amount of information it must process. It saves energy. It also simplifies your interpretation of the meaning of such object. Sensory information is meaningless because it could mean literally anything. And what's true for sensory information is true for information generally. There is no inherent meaning in information. It's what we do with that information that matters. We feel a lot of stuff going on under our hands, right? And we're conditioned to think it's certain things, whether the proof is there or not, right? And trained as an osteopath, we're also trained to conceive that we're affecting things that we obviously can't see. And I don't know if many people has done dissection, right? And if you've seen the liver, you've seen the viscera and everything like that. Well, you haven't seen it move. But then you're also expected to think that, you know, you can feel it move, or at least you can perceive a certain amount of movement. But these are the images we study the most. They're graphic representations. And now, when we're handling our hands on whoever's head, whoever's stomach, we have to have a graphic representation of what we're feeling is something here that we're affecting. We can't help ourselves. Right? And in uh, cranial sacral therapy, it's the exact same thing. Whatever you're feeling under your hand, you're primed to believe or at least uh, visualize that these are the things that you're influencing. These are the bones moving, which haven't been proven. And like I said, I won't even go into intra and inter um, raider. <laughs> That's right, thank you. Reliability. We, we, most of us people here, we all, know, we all know that it's inefficient and unreliable. So, I want you to try something. Of course, you notice, right, all the contour. It's all crooked and everything, but look at the middle. Look straight, straight into the middle. And this should take, I'm going to do this with you just to get the timing right. And something should happen. The edges should start, start to fix themselves. Your brain doesn't want to deal with useless noise. It takes too much energy, so for the sake of simplicity, it'll smooth everything out. But then if you blink and you look at the edges, it all breaks apart again. And you get the same thing, right? You can assume, and this is where I assume, and this is all my yellow card stuff, right? The same thing happens when we have our hand uh, over the head or over the skin of people. There's a lot of stuff going on, there's chaos, but we're primed to recognize certain things and we eliminate a lot of noise to try to make sense of what we're feeling. And look at the middle here again. And I'll do this with you. I don't know if uh, many of you look at these illusions, but uh, I did. And now your brain is working very hard to make sense of this, right? To figure out the pattern and just predict what's going on. And it's working really, really hard in just a few more seconds before everybody gets sick. It'll try to reproduce that pattern. It'll keep going. It'll try to make sense of what, and apply it to something else. And this is just our visual system. And what did I say? Our haptic system, our sense of touch, is associated with our visual cortex. The remarkable thing is that the sensory information coming into the brain hasn't changed at all. All that's changed is your brain's best guess of the cause of that sensory information, and that changes what you cons consciously hear and feel. Right? And this is, uh, thank you, Julie Tudor, for sending this my way. I'm just going to get this here. So this is the best illusion of the year 2019, and I really like this. Everybody should be seeing the same thing, right? But until there's a variable that changes the whole thing, and you can, can keep reading that. And when you have another element that's added to it, it changes a bit your perception. But it's still the same thing, and all of a sudden, it does something else. <laughs>
right? So imagine whatever practitioner, right, that day puts his hand on somebody's head, right, and he's feeling something. He's feeling something and he's predict that he's feeling something, but there's a variable that changes. We don't know what that variable is. Maybe it's how he's feeling that day. Maybe it's how the person is feeling that day. Maybe there's a funny smell. Maybe the room is a bit too cold. Maybe their hands are a little too cold. Maybe we won't get into this. Oh, no, sorry about that. I just did the wrong thing. So close. Here I am. Right? And what I was saying, <laughs> that we don't know what variables change that'll change our perception of what's happening. If a green bar across a screen, a horizontal bar, and a vertical bar would change what we perceive visually, what variable changes under our hands or in the context in their environment that's going to change our perception? We don't know. At least I don't think we do. I don't. I'll be honest, I don't. Okay? And palpation is classical conditioning. And this, this, this is what happens in the classroom, right? When we learn this stuff, we're all lined up with our hands there, very, very well intent on doing a good job because we want to pass our exam, because we're investing a lot of energy in understanding, because we want to do our best to help people, and we're sure that this is the best way to do it. All our best intentions are put into trying to learn and understand this. And then you have a teacher who has like this Leonard Cohen voice who goes across the room saying, who can eroticize anything with that voice? Feel the flesh dance in your hands. And do stuff like that. Maybe that didn't sound very erotic. <laughs> but, and this, this, is a, this is a red card moment, okay? And this is what I think. This is, this is a classroom setting. Everybody is doing this, right? With that, that uh, the teacher droning on and on with a very soothing voice. Who's the most susceptible between, or suggestible between the two? It's the person lying there because he's almost half asleep. He's, he's in a very suggestible state. And you have this, this and he, but he's a student too. He's thinking about this. And then, right after that, he's going to end up being the one who's going to do this. And he has been, according to me at least, and this would be really interesting to study, he has been heavily suggested to feel what has been proposed. I think there's, a, there's some hypnotism going on in there in the classroom. And we spend hours and hours and hours trying to get it right. So that's interesting. So there's a lot of group conditioning in there to feel that stuff. That's how we're primed. There's a lot of peer pressure because, oh my God, he felt something. She felt something. Why am, why am I not feeling anything? I can't do this. I'm not going to pass my exam. I'm $10,000 into this course and I'm not going to pass my exam. <laughs> There's a fear of missing out. You want that success. You want the success that all everybody else is, is, is getting. There's the bandwagon fallacy, right? If everybody, if everybody else feels it, I, I can feel it too. I'm, I'm validated in that sense. And there's a sunk cost fallacy, like I just said. I mean, I'm investing so much energy in there, it's gonna happen, I'm gonna make it happen. We don't just passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the inside in. Because what I've been trying to do is really celebrate uncertainty because I think only through uncertainty is there potential for understanding. And I really like that. I really don't know. And I, I, I put my hands on people every day, and I really don't know what's going on under there, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. But what I like about that is that in uncertainty, when something new pops up, it's something new, and it's something you want to understand. When you're absolutely certain what it is, or you're, you're dead set and, and fixed on knowing what's happening under there, you won't see anything new pop up. 
because you, you'll, you'll claim that it's, everything is known, you know everything about this. But when you're uncertain, you're really open to new propositions to whatever's happening. And it's not about me also, it's about what's happening to the person I'm with. So we can't conclude anything when we're relying on palpation alone. We can safely assume that we're compiling information, cortical processing, intuition, and creative freedom will help us interpret what's happening. And this, whoops, sorry about that. And this is, I've quoted Diane on this because uh, the first time I took the DNM workshop in 2012, this, this made me feel really good. It's okay to feel something. It's just not okay to believe it's anything. <laughs> so stuff is happening on their hands because they're very, very sensitive. And I'm, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm reassuring you, though. Thank you. Closing thoughts, and then, and then we can get some beer. <laughs> what? <laughs> we sir, I, anyways, I search for contrast. I assess and evaluate change, because it's really fun talking about illusions, but we do actually feel stuff under our hands, right? And it's not a question of thinking, oh, is it real, is it not? It's all real. It's all there. It's, the, it's what we make of that information that makes a difference. Right? We have to sort of, I, I, the last time I presented this, I felt I sort of had to reconcile reality and experience to not leave everybody like, what the hell? <laughs> we, you can assess and evaluate changes, what we feel under our hands. But we need to keep the locus of control and the inter, we have to respect the locus of control and interceptive domain of the person that's in front of us, that's feeling whatever they're feeling, whatever we're doing or acting upon, it's their business. It's about how they feel. And this, I really like to say this, and I don't know if I score a lot of points when I say this with my clients, but I can believe I'm feeling whatever I want. And this is especially tr true when they ask me because they've been treated by osteopaths before and they know osteopaths feel all sorts of funky stuff. What did you feel? And I answer this, I can feel anything I want. It's your opinion about what you feel that matters the most. How do you feel? Please tell me, do you feel better? What's different? Anything different, doesn't have to be better, anything different. And I always bring it back to them. It's not about me. People informed of the biases and pitfalls of their unconscious brains are better at using their conscious minds to overrule them. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. So normally I'm kind of a B word with the timing, but I loved, like I feel like this was a conversation that kind of needed to be had. Okay. Um, and there were only two questions. So, perfect, you already answered the questions without me even asking them. So I was gonna say meet him for a beer. Um, so Jamie, if your question still stands, this is what he looks like, you can find him later. Um, but honestly, that was a really great presentation. I think it's totally my bias. I try to be really neutral as the MC, but really, I think we need to have these conversations more and I loved that you had it, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so no questions, you're done. And then, yeah, a more applause. Get my friend on Facebook.